Um, so we've had a really interesting um, uh, four panelists and discussant on the evidence about birth settings. So um, we'll have people come to the microphone again, just uh, introduce yourself where you're from and give us a focused question for the panelists. Thank you. My name is Kate Finn, and I'm a private practice licensed midwife working in upstate New York. Uh, I'm addressing um, Dr. Waterberg and uh, really from my private practice that I had in Washington State during the time that uh, a seminal study was done on home birth safety in that, in that state um, by Pang uh, and then brought forward in the WAX meta-analysis. Um, I would like to just first state that as a person whose data was contributed to that study, I have some uh, knowledge about how the study was per performed. And I would just like to review a few things about um, the study that makes it uh, so that we can see that it's a systematic uh, design problem that discredits home birth midwifery and is brought forward And just a three or four comments and then, and then the question. Uh, first of all, it was not collaborative. There were no researchers on the team. It included home birth cases at 34 weeks gestation. RNs were included as home birth providers, even though it's not in their scope of practice. OBs were identified as providers in 7% of the births, even though there were no known OBs providing home birth services in, home, in Washington, that, that state. Birth certificate certifiers were included, and birth certificate certifiers are used to denote unattended births, uh, car births, and things like that. Home birth data did not include birth weights because there were not enough uh, birth weights in the home birth group to analyze, which is an indicator that there was not an attendant at the birth. Uh, most importantly, there was no anal analysis of the subgroup of licensed midwives and certified nurse midwives who were the attenders of the home birth at that time. So the study of Pang uh, is, uh, is not uh, relevant science to the safety of home birth, yet it was used uh, in, the met in the WAX meta-analysis. It inclu it's included as 40% of the births in, in the wax meta-analysis. And furthermore, the wax meta-analysis did not also uh, 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 separate data for uh, licensed midwives and nurse midwives. So the, the point I'm trying to make is, why are we still talking about this study? When we're looking at um, the safety of home birth, and can, what can we do to uh, remove this, these studies from the, from the dialogue and move forward? And what criteria would you have us have for moving forward with studies that will actually identify the safety of home birth and other birth settings. And are you directing that to one specific yeah, member? Do Dr. Uh, Waterberg, please. Okay. And, and I have, I have here, I have here that entire analysis uh, for anybody who wants to have it. I have uh, the, copies. The wax meta analysis caused quite a furor when it was published, and a lot of people have very strongly held opinions about various pieces and parts of it or the overall. The editors of the journal, in response to that, took it back and had an independent group of people reanalyze it and came to the same conclusions. I can't take responsibility for it. I was neither part of the original meta-analysis nor part of the re-review. But I would say that I, I credit those editors of the journal for saying, we take you seriously. We're going to come back and take a look at that and reanalyze it. And they ended up with the same results from that. I think, you know, it is what it is, and other studies will come along and either agree with it or disagree with it. Um, microphone number two. Okay. Hi, my name is Jill Arnold, and I'm here as a patient, and I also run a website called cesareanrates.com. Um, I really like Dr. Waterberg. I really liked your, your summary of everything, um, talking about the, what risk outweighs what benefits, and I just wanted to point out that I think that both the WK Kellogg Foundation and the IOM missed a tremendous opportunity here to actually take a multi-stakeholder approach and include a patient panel, especially following something like that. Um, I know a lot of people support me on that as well, um, to actually give patients a chance to stand at the podium and not here at the microphone. Not that I mind. Um, but we have an entire panel here that basically focused on the hospital is inherently stressful to women, and that women have stress responses in hospitals, and you know, using words like optimal childbirth, normal childbirth, satisfying, things like that, those aren't universal to all women, and that's not how it's experienced. I know some subjectivity was pointed out, you know, or owned. Um, but for a lot of people, optimal childbirth means making it through childbirth healthy, alive, and without a ton of pain, and that's okay. And that might not be optimal to these experts, but to have a patient voice saying that would be very, very important. Because, um, you know, interventions without clear benefit, well, pain relief is a clear benefit to some women, you know, to a lot of women. <laughs> 
So I just think that this is a missed opportunity to not let patients say directly what research we think is important, how we make decisions, how we process risk, risk, and I don't know, maybe when this reconvenes in 30 years, we'll have patients. Thanks. Thank you, Jill. Harris? Uh, Saraswati Vedam. Um, I, my question is to Dr. Sandal and, and Dr. Wetwater. Actually, I, I thank you all. It was uh, excellent you know, presentations, all of them today. I, I wanted to ad address um, both the uh, apparent incre the increase uh, noted among nullips um, or primers, prim prim primiferous women, women uh, at planned home birth, uh, in an intention to treat model, which you have in your study, and there are some others who've looked at that too, I wonder, since it's well documented, really, with every uh, well-designed study, including Patty Jansen's study, that uh, in an intention to treat model, uh, the largest rate of transfer from home to hospital, uh, the, the, lar the largest category reason is for failure to progress, and that is almost always for a for first-time mothers, right? So I wonder if you your team plans to analyze or do a sub-analysis of those women who did transfer for failure to progress and the effects of augmentation on that composite outcome, because that would, you know, certainly uh, ha must, uh, while we may not ever know the real reason, that certainly must have something to do with it. Jane? Reply on that. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to clarify that the increased um, rate of adverse outcomes was only in the nullips planning birth at home and not in the multips. Even in the restricted analysis, there was still no significant difference in adverse outcomes for multips. And I think it's really important that the poor outcomes for the nullips doesn't get, uh, uh, the message doesn't come out that home birth is unsafe for all women, low risk women who are planning that. Um, we are doing further analysis. We have more funding to do more analysis of the co birth cohort data. We, I can tell you what we're looking at, what the objectives are for their ongoing analysis. Um, we're looking at the variations in service organization on some of those maternal outcomes. Uh, we're looking at the issue of intrapartum transfer and looking at all the data that we have on transfer and of the adverse outcomes and trying to unpick what was going on with that in terms of time, distance with the data that we have and for, for the nullips and the multips. And we, one of the other things that we're doing is looking at the clinical characteristics and the outcomes of the higher risk women who were not included in that 65,000 women, but who chose to give birth in an out of, in an out of obstetric unit you know, setting. So that's the ongoing analysis that we're doing. We've also um, done some qualitative work looking at how different uh, midwife units are configured and delivered and looked at some of the issues that Ellen was talking about with staffing and women's experiences of giving birth in those different settings. So yes, we are looking at that. Whether we have enough data on our data extraction sheets, because it's an anonymized data and we can't go back to the woman's records to be unpick to the satisfaction that we would like to, I don't know. And my final message is that uh, the event rate was, was very small. There were 32 stillbirths and, and neonatal deaths in a sample of 65,000 women. So I think it's really important to remember that the overall adverse outcome rate was low. Nevertheless, it gives us important messages and questions to think about how we deliver our services. In the context of, uh, and perhaps I wasn't totally clear, in the context of the rest of the panel's um, suggestions, you know, first-time mothers have never experienced, they've sh shifting environment, environments, they've never experienced a birth environment before. Now they're being augmented or whatever, which is the most likely reason. And I know that in Patty Jansen's work, which did compare apples to apples, midwives, the same midwives at home and the, those same midwives providing care in the hospital so that, you know, so presumably the care provider effect was controlled for. Um, but they found that as far as the impact of birth setting on at least 
uh, morbidity and in interventions, clearly the setting was having something to do with it because the same midwives with the same low risk population, when they delivered in the hospital, there were higher rates, rates of intervention and, and more morbidity, so. Thank you. Hello, my name is Nick Krabashkin. I'm an obstetrician in San Francisco. <clears throat> and um, I wanted to share a brief patient story to demonstrate a point. I, I saw um, a woman follow up a year after um, a C-section I performed when she had twins and a presentation of acute fatty liver pregnancy. She was very ill. She was jaundiced. She was in the IC. Her surgery was complicated. She was in the ICU. And a year later, she was coming back to me. We were processing. I had just you know some questions for her about her childbirth. And, um, and she asked me this really pointed question. She was like, what do you remember about my boys being born? Um, in, a se in, in essence, asking me, kind of like helping her recover some of those memories that she was um, mourning. It. And I've been thinking about this for a while. And this, this question she asked me kind of really makes me think about a research agenda for women who experience pathologic births too. And that while our focus on low, uh, you know, low risk women is laudable and necessary, but what lessons can we take from low risk women and apply to women who have, you know, judicious necessary interventions, or what you know, what kind of research do we can we do on their needs to give them still the healthiest outcomes afterwards? So, thanks. I think you bring up a very important point that all women need supportive care and support of their physiologic capacities, regardless if they're ill or well, throughout the whole process. Frank Chervenak, obstetrician, New York City. Professor Sandel, uh, first, can I say congratulations. The birthplace study was difficult to do. You and your collaborators, an important piece of work for, for all of us to learn from. A concern, a concern with your last slide. Uh, as you said, Great Britain has straightened financial considerations. America does too. Before a conclusion is published that home birth costs less than hospital birth, it's essential that all the costs of home birth be included. You, you quote a transport rate of 45% of prima gravidas. I can't comment about Great Britain, but I can comment about New York City. The transport cost of that number of women, when you figure all of the transport costs, it's not inconsequential. The transport costs, the doctors on the receiving end, are very substantial. You mentioned there's an incremental a number of infants with what's your term adverse outcome. And some of those are bad, such as neonatal encephalopathy. Not too many. Can't comment about Great Britain, but in the United States, it doesn't take too many infants with neonatal encephalopathy to, to calculate the lifetime cost that is, again, not inconsequential. So I, I just urge everyone, before a conclusion that home birth is less expensive than hospital birth, all of the true costs be factored in but before such a conclusion is made. Yes. Hi. Can you hear me? Um, I think you do your best with costing. You have funding for so many years, and you can only follow women and babies up for the length of time that we did, which was a, a short period of time. Um, I agree with you. Those, on, those ongoing costs for babies with poor outcomes could be modeled. We would never know the true cost, because they would go on, as you say, their lifetime costs. Um, I think when you're looking at cost of poor outcomes, you have to look at the cost of those poor outcomes, whatever setting they come from. Uh, and I think when we said, we said quite clearly that we've done the best that we can with the costing model that we have, but we're only looking at that short follow-up period of time. So of course, anyone will be thinking, if you're looking at total cost, the service, then you have to think about the ongoing costs for, for, for those infants and, and for poor maternal outcomes. I didn't mention there were no maternal deaths in this study, and I should have done. Um, 
I think you're, you were next. Sorry. I, I'm also from Cornell. I'm Dr. Grunebaum, Director of Obstetrics. My question is partially for Ms. Sandel. Um, my understanding is that there is a certain way of midwives to be trained in England, and there's a different way in the United States. We heard this morning from um, Ms. McDorman that there are certified nurse midwives and what she said, other midwives, delivering babies at home. Um, how can you compare the education of British midwives with those that we call here other midwives or professional midwives? I'm not sure I know enough about the details of the different training and competencies of the American um, midwifery workforce. Uh, all I can say is that in the UK and in the US, um, we aim to achieve the ICM competency standards for education and for practice. Um, apart from that, I don't, I don't think I would be in a position to comment. Simply to say that in the UK, midwives um, have, we have a national certification the education we have a we have a national um, I wouldn't say it was a national curriculum but we have national competencies that the HEIs have to achieve and we have clinical experience and um, competencies that are nationally approved um, of course even within a national system like that you have variation between different training providers uh, and of course post training you are going to have midwives who are going to be working in community-based practices that will inevitably develop um, more skill working in those practices, just as midwives working in high-risk settings will develop um, specialist skills in those settings. Um, but I, I think that's all I can do to say to help you. So maybe somebody else can help me in this room. One of the certified nurse midwives can tell me what their training looks like. And one of the uh, professional midwives can tell me what their training looks like. Thank you. I'm, I'm Tanya Tanner. I'm with the American College of Nurse Midwives and also faculty at Frontier Nursing University. The American College of Nurse Midwives, along with several other organizations, have recently completed an analysis of our educational programs in light of the ICM standards. And we find that we do meet the ICM standards and pretty much every area as well. We also have a national certification exam that's required in order to be licensed in each state. And so if you have a certified nurse midwife in your state, you can be assured that she's been educated in an accredited program by the Department of Education, that she's taken a national standardized exam and has been certified as being safe to practice by another midwife who has also been uh, certified as able to teach or in a position where she has the knowledge needed to teach midwives. And after that exam is taken, they pass the exam, then they can apply for licensure in their state. And so there is a national certification exam for certified nurse midwives. And I can't speak for certified professional midwives, but I know there are people in the room that can. The certified nurse midwives are nurses first. Certified midwives do not um, necessarily need to be nurses before starting their program. They're all master's degree prepared. And certified nurse midwives have the highest number of doctoral degrees in the nursing profession as a subset. I'm sorry? Yes, yes. Certified nurse midwives are educated on performing birth in all settings to an acceptable safe standard. Yes. Uh, Ida, do you want to come forward? As, I'm, I, I asked uh, Mary, I'm asking Ida to, to represent Hi, my name is Ida Dara. I represent the certified professional midwife uh, that is um, credentialed by the North American Registry of Midwives. We are not nurses first, though a lot of CPMs do have nursing degrees and master's degrees and PhD degrees, but it's not required for the midwife to have those degrees. We do have a national curriculum that is set based on our accreditation policies. Our credential is accredited by the National Commission on Certifying Agencies. We do come up with our uh, curriculum that has to be met. We just allow many routes in order to meet that curriculum as long as you are taught by a qualified instructor. We have a supervised practicum that um, has to be met um, in a clinical setting. And then we have our national exams, our hands-on skills exam, and our 
written exam that must be uh, passed in order to receive the credential. Then after the credential is received, the CPM can apply for licensure. It's, the CPM is not a license, it's a credential. And with that, you apply for licensure in the states that license CPMs. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. There's a brief overview um, on your, the roll-up thing that, that we got of the various um, routes to midwifery. So, Pat? Yes, I just need to add one more piece to the CM. Bottom line is, particularly in the state of New York, and that's why I got up here, because the previous gentleman is from New York, and I want no confusion to exist in his mind about midwifery in New York State. Uh, bottom line is midwives certified through the AMCB, which is a certification body for certified nurse midwives and certified midwives, basically has set up the plan, the program, and attest to the equal competencies or identical competencies and knowledge and skills that CMs and CMs have. And the only difference is nurse midwives go through the nursing door to get to midwifery. Non-nurses go through what we consider a kind of pre-midwifery door to get to midwifery. They all get the basic prerequisites, and then they both go through exactly the same education process and certification process to get their two separate credentials as either a certified midwife or a certified midwife. So for all intents and purposes, at the midwifery level, they are identical midwives. Thank you, Pat. Uh, Mari? I'm Mari Rothman, a certified nurse midwife uh, in a home birth practice. Um, I just wanted to say I really would welcome research into the relative costs of different birth settings because um, I think you would have to do a whole lot of transfers in order to equal the costs of the cesarean sections that are saved by home birth the, the epidurals that are saved by home birth, the cost of all the vacuum extractions and forceps deliveries that are saved by home birth, the increased breastfeeding that saves money on formula for home birth. There, there is a lot of hidden cost savings in home birth also. Um, and I would welcome research that looks into that. Mary? Hi, Mary Lawler. Um, uh, Dr. Scala, I wanted just to go back to something that you talked about in your um, in your presentation. You called it a black box that we're operating in, and um, we we choose in the process of care to intervene or to avoid interventions, with the intention of of avoiding of improving long term health consequences for women and babies. And yet, the typically research ends at the point of discharge from care. And so I just wanted to ask you what you what you might might think about what you might recommend around um, studying the impact of these choices of, to intervene or to not intervene on the lives of women and families long term. Thank you for that question. Um, I realize that it's expensive to do the studies, but what's more expensive is complete and utter ignorance uh, for these four million mothers and babies every year moving forward. So I don't think we can afford not to look at these questions. And I just, I'd just just like to give one example. There was have been so much discussion of late about um, pelvic floor outcomes, of course, very important to women. And I, I wonder um, with if you have practitioners that aren't doing directed pushing, that aren't doing fundal pressure, that are doing no or very few episiotomies, um, limiting assisted delivery, and so forth. Just a totally different style of supine positions for giving birth. It, what is the effect on pelvic floor outcomes? And I have to say, I haven't been able to find one study that tried to look at um, the long-term effects when we um, are using these conservative types of care. So that's just one example that I would like to give um, about the importance of understanding differences in birth settings. They, they could be really profound. A few decades ago, um, we had this uh, South African doula trial. Um, and they, they found significant differences very dramatic for many outcomes in terms of family functioning, how the uh, baby's infection, baby's breastfeeding, go going out uh, to at least six weeks. And I thought that was going to be open the watershed to say, what are the implications of different kinds of interpartum care 
for the family well-being moving forward, and we still haven't done it to this date. Thank you, Carol. I um, would like to just, uh, we are at the end of time, so I want to summarize um, just a couple of things and to lay the groundwork as we go into the next panel on workforce and, a, and one of the panels tomorrow on data. I think it's clear, it's been pointed out, that we lack an integrated system. And that system is also lacking in terms of how we regulate our health professionals, how we license them, how we look at accountability, how we collect data on what, uh, what how care is provided and what the outcomes are. And so um, as we continue to, to listen to these panels, I, I want to keep that up uh, in, in the surface of everyone's minds to be thinking about um, what all of these, these issues mean to us. How do we make birth best in all settings? Um, and how do we integrate all settings? So I would like to personally thank panel three for a fantastic uh, presentation. Thank you.